Hello, Dr. Childers here again. So we have discussed the domains of knowledge that are necessary for professional competence. We have discussed the right of parents to expect that mental health professionals are competent and, and that we, we do the right thing where our assessments are adequate and, and sufficient to support our findings, our diagnostic findings and our forensic testimony, and that we possess the necessary domains of competence um, needed for an appropriate assessment of the pathology. In this particular video segment, I'm going to discuss what's going to be happening as we move forward as targeted parents begin to require professional competence for mental health professionals. Now, I come, uh, that my high conflict divorce and attachment related pathology and high conflict divorce is not my primary field. I come out of ADHD. That's, that's my primary field. And I kept working younger and younger in the age group, about mid nineties. I dropped below the age of five, developed a secondary background in early childhood mental health related to ADHD. And but that also involves a knowledge of attachment system and attachment trauma and those sorts of things. So I'm actually coming out of the worlds of ADHD and um, early childhood mental health. Autism to some degree, because that's a, a differential diagnosis in early childhood ADHD symptoms, trauma. And so I know autism and that, that world as well. In the world I come from, there are substantial standards of practice for the assessment of pathology. And so up on my website, I, I posted the intake assessment when I was clinical director of an early childhood assessment center. I, I, we had a, um, an intake assessment protocol, 11 pages for intake of all families. And it, it provides an example of what type of information and the depth and the breadth of information that we would collect as a standard of practice in early childhood mental health, dealing with the issues that we find in early childhood mental health. Now, that um, assessment form that's up on my website uh, is, uh, I would consider it a standard of practice. And, and out there where I come from, clinical director, clinics, early childhood mental health, that would be, yeah, it's, it's kind of standard of practice to collect that domain of information, the breadth of information, the type of information in early childhood. Now, for over in ADHD, we have a whole different assessment protocol. We got, you know, Connors and child behavior checklists and CPTs, and we would be collecting a different type of information. And yet the assessment protocols would be very similar. They'd be semi-structured, flexibly standardized sort of assessment protocols for ADHD. Autism has their own thing. They have their cars and their speech and language assessments and stuff. Based on these, these assessments, standard practice assessments, we might then go deeper into some issue. So uh, early childhood, if we get in sensory motor stuff, we might ask for a, an occupational therapy evaluation for the sensory motor processing. If we had ADHD and we're getting some learning disability signs, we might go for a learning disability assessment, you know, IQ test and, and um, achievement test or something. And so based on the assessment findings from the initial, we may do additional assessment. Uh, all of this is, I would consider, standard practice. And this is just professional competence. When I came over here to addressing attachment-related pathology surrounding high-conflict divorce, when I moved into this particular field, the forensic kind of-ish field, I was stunned and appalled at the absence of professional practice standards regarding the assessment of pathology. It is like Dodge City out there, uh, you know, Deadwood. It, it, it is a wild place where people are just kind of making stuff up. It's, it's very idiosyncratic. It's, there's no standardization to the assessment. There's no structure. There's no standardized information that we are collecting as part of that assessment of attachment-related pathology surrounding divorce. And while these other you know, ADHD or autism or, or early childhood mental health all 
have established sort of protocols for intake assessment. The absence of any sort of standardized assessment protocol for attachment-related pathology surrounding divorce is incredibly concerning. We are dealing, in this area, we are dealing with the court system and decisions that can have massive impact on the child's development, family relationships, uh, for decades into the future. Huge decisional uh, kinds of issues that we're addressing. And we are dealing with the court system who expects us to maintain a ex very high level of professional competence. When we're dealing with the court, to personal opinion, that shouldn't be the lowest standard of practice. That should be the highest standard of practice when we're dealing with the court system. So, so we should have the highest professional standards for competence and for assessment and for documentation of our assessment in this field. And instead, from everything I see, we got the lowest. We, there's no professional standards practice regarding the assessment and diagnosis of attachment-related pathology surrounding divorce. So targeted parents and their children it is now incumbent upon them to expect and require and to hold mental health professionals accountable to a standard of practice. Unless we do it for ourselves, unless we hold ourselves accountable to standards of practice and professional competence, then they've got to do it. They've got to do it because we are failing them. The APA is failing to support its requirement for professional competence. And, and this whole field is just, is failing targeted parents. And so they have to move the field into professional competence on their own. Now, when there is a failure, when there is a violation of professional practice standards, such as a violation of 2.01a regarding competence, a violation of 9.01a regarding assessment that then leads to a violation of 3.04 regarding harm to the client, um, and a failure in the duty to protect a child from psychologically abusive parenting. When you have that type of failure by a mental health profession, the first step is to bring the client's concerns to the therapist. But if they brought those concerns to you, foundations and the diagnostic checklist and the pathogenic parenting scale and they brought you information and you have just simply refused to recognize it, refused to integrate it, refused to deal with that information, then that's a violation of 2.03 regarding maintaining competence. So now we got a whole set of really problematic violations of the APA ethics code. The only recourse available to targeted parents, the appropriate resource or to address grievances under those circumstances, would be for the targeted parent to file a licensing board complaint. So that's what's going to be coming down the road. Is the, are these targeted parents, if they don't receive an appropriate assessment of attachment-related pathology surrounding divorce, if and if mental health professionals who are doing the assessment diagnosis don't have the appropriate domains of knowledge necessary for professional competence and therefore don't do proper assessment and therefore there's harm to the client and therefore there's a failure in the duty to protect, those parents are going to begin filing licensing board complaints um, against the therapist. Now, again, I don't want that, but that's they have a right to expect professional competence and that's the right thing to do. So I want to alert you a little bit about this so that it doesn't catch you by surprise um, and so that you can begin to integrate this into your practice. What those licensing board complaints are going to be looking at, and I'll tell you right now, what those are the, the five areas that they are going to address in a complaint against you if you are ignorant and incompetent which is they're going to, uh, the, the two main areas are going to be a violation of 2.01a on um, professional competence and a violation of 9.01a that you didn't do a proper uh, assessment sufficient to, to uh, substantiate your diagnostic findings or your forensic testimony. 
So those are going to be the two main violations. Then because of that, you, there was any harm to the client, so there's going to be a violation of 3.04. Because of that initial violation, there's also a failure in duty to protect, so there's a, a problem there. And because of that, they tried to provide you with information, but you refused to incorporate the information or, or utilize the information or do anything about the information. That's going to be a violation of 2.03. So we're going to have two main ones and, and three secondary standards, which are going to be in the allegation. Now, is the licensing board going to do anything? Probably not. Uh, they're, they're, this, things are shifting, and so they're, they're not going to quite know what to make of this, and so it, they probably won't sanction you. They're, they're going to ask for what we're going to be seeking, the targeted parent is going to be seeking, is your VITA. Where in your VITA do you demonstrate your knowledge of the attachment system? Where in your VITA do you, have you acquired knowledge of personality pathology? Where in your VITA have you acquired family systems training? Where in your VITA have you acquired complex trauma knowledge? And so it's going to, they're going to look at those specific things and, and, did you, and relative to 2.01a, saying you're practicing beyond the boundaries of your competence. Then over a 9.01, they're going to look at where in your assessment did you document pathogenic parenting? Where in your assessment did you incorporate the potential narcissistic borderline parent cross-generational coalition? Show us in your treatment notes. Show us in your assessment, your intake assessment, where you assessed for the cross-generational coalition of the child with an alive parent. And so those are going to be the domains of the complaint that are going to look at um, your practice, your background, 2.01a, and your competent assessment, 9.01a, and documentation of your competent assessment. Now, the license board may not do anything about that. Um, but what is going to happen? So you Licensing board complaint, you get away, you, nothing happens. They say, okay, case closed. Good. The next parent that comes through, if you do the same thing, they're, you're going to be looking at another licensing board complaint. And they may not do anything this time. The second time, oh, well, next one comes through, you're going to be looking at another licensing board complaint. And what we're doing, what the targeted parents are doing, is the licensing board, in order to not sanction you, for violations of 2.01a and 9.01a and 3.04 and 2.03 and failure to protect, they're going to have to overlook your ignorance and incompetence. And they're going to have to overlook it and say, well, you know what, it's okay for you to be ignorant and incompetent. And what targeted parents are going to do is they're going to make the licensing boards do that over and over and over again. We're going to make it very uncomfortable for the licensing board to continue to condone and collude with professional ignorance and incompetence. And, and so eventually the licensing board is going to say, you know what, we're tired of colluding with incompetence. You guys need to know what you're doing. Do an adequate assessment. Document it. That's, that's, that's what targeted parents are seeking. They're seeking a level of professional competence, a level of professional knowledge and expertise in the assessment of pathology, standards of practice for assessment, gather certain information, know about the attachment system, know about personality pathology, know about family system stuff, and assess it and document it. Now, the licensing board complaints are the appropriate avenue um, and, and one of the things that these parents may do, just, just so you're aware, is I'm suggesting that the parents, if they were thinking about forming, uh, filing a licensing board complaints based on these four um, or five categories of violation, those standards, that if they're thinking about that, I'm suggesting that they write to the APA Ethics Committee and ask them and say, look, I'm concerned about professional competence. I'm concerned about violations of these kinds of things. What should I do about that? And I'm suspecting that the response they're going to get from the APA Ethics Committee is take it up with your therapist. Well, we did. We brought up issues of foundations and the 
protocol and stuff, but the therapist is non-responsive to that. So I've tried to address it with the therapist, but the therapist is just shutting me down. So therefore, what's the next step is to, if you have concerns about those as a parent, as a client, is to take them up with the licensing board and, and, and file a complaint. That's the appropriate step. And so I'm hoping or recommending that targeted parents get a letter from the APA Ethics Committee saying, you know, if you're concerned about that, take it up with the licensing board. So that will be part of the uh, package that is submitted in the complaint is this letter from the APA saying, if you have concerns, take it up with the, the licensing board. Because that's what they're supposed to do. Now, there's also a dangerous element, a risk assessment element, having to do with uh, malpractice lawsuits. Uh, and so let me address that in the next segment. Um, and this is going to become a very dangerous kind of thing if you don't know what you're doing. So let me address that uh, issue of malpractice in the next video segment.